Our event this evening uh, is a broadly speaking event for those of you who are uh, fans of our broadly speaking events. Uh, more than mere victims, uh, women and violent extremism. Uh, I want to start just by thanking uh, a number of uh, the people who made this happen. Uh, the, our, the staff uh, at Civic Hall, uh, particularly Marissa Mlotek, uh, and particularly our colleagues uh, at the Royal Norwegian Consulate General and uh, at the uh, UN, the Norwegian mission to the United Nations. We have done a number of events uh, with the Norway in various incarnations, and we're very happy uh, to be partners. Uh, I also want to thank Liza Mundy and Catherine Zopf, uh, who are the uh, editors and curators uh, of Broadly Speaking, uh, and uh, the, Liza is the director of the Breadwinning and Caregiving Program at New America. Before we start our conversation, uh, I have the honor uh, of introducing our special guest, uh, the, the, uh, Her Excellency, uh, Minister Solway Horne, uh, who is the Minister of Children, Equality, and Social Inclusion in Norway. For the Americans in the audience, yes. <laughs> the very fact that she has that title, says so much. <laughs> um, so Minister Horne uh, has been, uh, she's a, has, has a, is a politician in the Progress Party. Uh, she's been the Minister of Children Equality and Social Inclusion since October 2013, uh, and is part of the cabinet of Prime Minister Erna Solberg. Uh, whom we, we had an occasion to do an event with uh, last September. She's been an elected official since 1995. Uh, she was elected to the Storting, the Norwegian uh, parliament, um, the, from uh, Rogaland in the 2005 election and has been re-elected uh, for two consecutive terms in 2009 and 2013. Uh, since being elected, she served on the Standing Committee on Justice and the Standing Committee on, fa on Family and Cultural Affairs. As minister, uh, Minister Horne has been a leader in the policies for paternity leave and family policy, particularly, this is also for Americans amazing to hear, the cash benefit uh, that allows parents to keep children uh, at home uh, instead of uh, in kindergarten. She's also called for the um, introduction of maybe the only American custom that or Norwegians would want to import in the area of family and child policy, uh, but the custom of date night, uh, which does allow uh, people to remember they're not just parents. So with that, I would love to uh, invite um, uh, Minister Horne to the podium uh, to give her remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie, and uh, thank you so much for, to your colleague and also to your staff for arranging this, uh, this event. We are in Norway, the Norwegian uh, uh, Council, we are grateful for this opportunity to work together with New America and also to shed light on this very important issue that we are going to, to, uh, to handle this, uh, this evening. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, millions of people around the world are suffering from war and conflict which lead to devastating consequences for women and girls. Homes are ruined, and women and children are forced to flee. They are taken hostages, they are raped, and they are killed. Women and girls all over the world, not only in conflict-affected countries, suffer from widespread and serious human rights violations. In Syria and Iraq, Teenage girls are captured by easels, soldiers who sell them as slaves. 270 teenage girls in Nigeria were kidnapped in April last year and are still not released from Boko Haram. In Pakistan, the Taliban shot and nearly killed Malala simply for wanting an education. Serious violation against women and girls is a common thread among the violent extremists. Their fear of gender equality ties them together. My own country is no stronger to violent extremism. The act of uh, terrorism on 22nd July 2011 in Norway were the most violent act my country has experienced since the Second World War. It shocked our society in a very core. The tragic event reminds us that extremism is not only linked to Islam. 
Norway's uh, homegrown terrorist called himself a Christian. His hatred against women's rights and equality bears a strike resembles to, uh, to that of extremists from other parts of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Security Council Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security, has made it clear that women's participation, rights and needs are important factors for internationally peace and security. Society with a high degree of gender equality tend to be more peaceful and have fewer conflicts. Last year, the Security Council adopted a resolution calling for the promotion of women's empowerment to halt the spread of violence extremism. In other words, the link between women's empowerment, gender equality and measures to counter radicalization are recognized. If we want to effectively fight violence extremism, we should listen to the women and on the ground and support their work. Women are not only victims of extremists. They are also a force to be reckoned with both in good and sometimes bad ways. Some women join violent movements. Others can be buffered against the spread of violent extremism in their communities and their countries. Norway has a long tradition of supporting women's leaders and their organization on the ground in fragile and conflicted affected countries. We see there is a need for target strategies, efforts in countering those, these complex challenges. Internationally, the Norwegian government's aim is a much stronger implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325. Therefore, a few weeks ago, my government launched a revised action plan on women, peace and security. The action plan is our tool to help enforcing the UN Security Council resolutions. This is done through broad cooperation, including civil society. The plan focused on specific areas, for instance, women's participation in peace processes. It will be an important part of our security and foreign policy in the year ahead of us. Another important action plan my government had launched is against radicalization and violence extremism. Measures listed here are important for our international work, but they are also important for how we deal with these threats in the national and local level. Preventive efforts are key in ensuring fundamental values such as democracy, human rights and security. And let me be clear, Norway will continue to lead the way when it comes to gender equality and women's rights internationally. We strongly believe it is a condition for sustainable peace and development. Therefore, we have also made girls' access to education a top priority in our development policy. Girls in areas affected by conflict often lose the opportunity to go to school. And ensuring education for children, including in conflict area, is our common responsibility. If we fail to deliver, we are bound to see more extremism and less peace. I'm looking forward tonight to hear the debate this evening on the role of women in countering violent extremism. You all represent an impressive range of knowledge and expertise, and I'm very much looking forward to hear your different viewpoint tonight. This year, with the celebration in the, uh, in the UN, Beijing Plus 20, and the marking of the 15th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325, we have an, a unique opportunity to renew our commitments toward gender equality. So I would like to end by echoing UN women in setting 2030 as the end date for the gender inequality. By then, the world needs to be more equal, and more equal place, especially for women. Thank you.
So I now have the pleasure to introduce the moderator of our panel, Lydia Polgreen. Uh, uh, Lydia Polgreen is the deputy uh, international editor of the New York Times. Uh, she's been at the Times since 2002, uh, where she was from 2005 to 2009, the West Africa correspondent. Uh, and certainly uh, that experience is highly uh, relevant to the, the, the violence we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, and from 2009 to 2011, the South Africa correspondent, uh, she has won uh, numerous prizes, including the George Polk Award for foreign reporting uh, for her coverage uh, of the violence and the conflict in, in Darfur uh, in Sudan. So uh, Lydia Polgreen, who will then uh, introduce our panel, uh, and we will have our discussion. So we have a great group of people with a really um, wide breadth of um, knowledge from places all around the world. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time on their bios because you guys can all Google them on your phones. But um, just very quickly, we have uh, Peter Bergen, who is you know one of the premier journalists of our time, covered the wars in Iraq. His book Manhunt is the definitive um, telling of the hunt for bin Laden. Lately, he's been doing a lot of reporting around um, ISIS and particularly looking at the women who are joining ISIS and what their motivations are. We have Mona El Tahawe, whose uh, book Headscarves and Hymens is about to come out. She is a, lean, a leading uh, journalist and commentator on the issues uh, surrounding women in the Muslim world. Uh, she's also a contributing columnist to the New York Times. Uh, we have Asne Sayersta, whose new book, One of Us, is the story of um, Anders Breivik, the um, man who massacred 77 people in Norway. Um, and uh, she'll be talking to us about the extreme roots of his um, of his violent ph uh, philosophy. And then Alexis Okeo, who is a contributing writer at The New Yorker and who is currently working on a book um, about standing up to people standing up to extremism in Africa. So I'd like to invite them all to join me on the stage. We've all agreed in advance that we're going to be very kind to poor Peter, who's <laughs> outnumbered on this panel. We took a vote and we decided not to engage in the ritual sacrifice that is traditional in such feminist gatherings. Um, so, Peter, you can let Thank your you. guard down. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're all coming at this question from a lot of different perspectives. So I thought I'd start with something really general. Um, is violent extremism, regardless of whether it springs from um, you know, nationalism, from a, a faith, um, a, a particular misguided faith, is it inherently um, anti-feminist and misogynistic? Um, it, I'd love to hear, I'll say for you to, to maybe ta tackle that for us first. Um, it seems it is. Uh, uh, scholars uh, say that all racist ideologies have a, a big portion of misogyny in them. Uh, and I think that most of the extremist uh, trends that we see today are definitely racist trends. Uh, and uh, in um, Breivik's case, uh, he, uh, of course, his main goal is to get rid of Muslims from Europe. They should either be deported, convert, or get killed. Uh, but he says, uh, I'll just say briefly now, but he says that who's to blame for this? Who's to blame for the Islamization of Europe? It is the feminists. That is logical turn because the feminists have feminized Europe, so we can't stand up to the Muslims. And uh, he says that his accounts is that between half a million and one million Western European women have been raped by Muslims. And no one is there to stand up for them because the feminists have feminized the Norwegian or the, the European man. So that's definitely a very core of his ideology is anti-feminism. And he wants to, uh, wanted to restore a patriarchic uh, Europe uh, where men rule uh, and women are back to uh, more reproductive role, uh, banned from higher education. And uh, it's interesting to see many of his points. There are some countries in the world that, that have um, some of these parts in their uh, constitution, if you include the ban of female driving. So okay. it's, it's interesting to see how these <clears throat> extremist ideologies, how they are very uh, similar on several points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But do you find, um, someone maybe you could pick it up from there, do you find points of connection um, with the um, particular brands of extremism that we're seeing flowering in the post-Arab Spring um, Middle East right now? Um, um, where are the commonalities and where are the divergences? 
Well, I think, first of all, it, it's really important to, to, to look at religions across the world. And we were talking earlier about Abrahamic religions and what they have in common. And I think, you know, having lived in Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and, and the United States most recently, and speaking as an Egyptian Muslim, you know, I see the common threads between, say, ultra-Orthodox men who will delay planes for hours because women are sitting next to them, to what I call the Christian Brotherhood here in the United States, and the damage they've done to reproductive rights in, you know, many southern states and across the country, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And, and often, and I say this jokingly, but it's quite serious, I say, you know, all these men are basically obsessed with women's vaginas, and I always tell them, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. And I think that's, <laughs> that's the common thread. But, and, and so when I look now at, you know, Egypt and the other countries in the region, and, you know, you take a country like Saudi Arabia, which is perhaps the example that we all think of as the most extreme when it comes to misogyny, and you see women infantilized there, you know, beyond belief treated as five-year-olds almost for their entire lives. And then you see, you know, what, what has happened in Egypt, and essentially, to, to, to kind of wrap it up really quickly, that there's a visceral realization among many men, whether they belong to extremist groups or not, that women have basically broken down this door, and they're out there now, in what used to be a male-dominated, and, and this great sense of entitlement to public space. And so you hear about these mob sexual assaults, sexual violence in, in increasing, more and more women speaking out. So it, it's this kind of moment in history where men realize they've been challenged in unprecedented ways. And then my challenge for me, and that, that, you know, that I try to deal with in the book and my own writing, and that we're talking about today, is, is women who choose to, to remain in these fundamentalist Islamist groups, like the Muslim Brotherhood, and then who, those who go to join uh, groups in, in the Arab world, we call them Daesh, because they don't like to be called Daesh, and I call them murderous shits, excuse my language, but it's really important for me as a Muslim to make that distinction. So for, from the women who go all the way to these violent radical extremists, to those who support groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and support things like female genital mutilation, what makes these women kind of give in to patriarchy and become the foot soldiers of patriarchy mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of a lifetime concern for me. So I think it's, it's both a historical moment and a moment of real questioning for these women. Whose side are you on? Because this is the time to decide. Yeah. Um, I think that also we're seeing an you know we're seeing an interesting moment um, that that crosses our, our the, the the sort of the concerns that we're seeing in the Middle East and in Europe. Um, and, and you have to wonder: does this sort of in your face? Uh, you're seeing more and more people in your, in Europe, both men and women, um, going to join ISIS, being drawn into um, these this this kind of violent extremist um, uh, movement. Um, and, and you have to ask, to what extent is the kind of in-your-face secularism of Europe um, um, driving um, this, this, this feeling, this feeling of, 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 of alienation? I mean, whether it's you know, hardline bans on headscarves, um, you know, uh, things like uh, Charlie Hebdo, um, is, is that sort of is that sort of part of, 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 of what would create an embattled sense of, um, of space for people of the Islamic faith in Europe? Um, I mean, I think there's a very telling statistic, which is 10% of the French uh, population is Muslim, 70% of the prison population in France is Muslim. So that's an astonishing statistic. Um, but that said, I mean, uh, that isn't true in the United States. American Muslims are better educated, have higher incomes than the average American, and yet we're still seeing people attracted in small numbers from the States. It's not like the hundreds we're seeing from France and the UK and Holland and even you know, scores from Norway and you know, we're seeing, and the one big difference is we are seeing women. We, we at the New America Foundation are looking at every single named individual uh, who's gone, of which are about just around 600. We found that 10% of them are women. Uh, our average age is 18, which is kind of an amazing number. Um, and this is unprecedented. We didn't see this during the Afghan war. We didn't see it in the Bosnian war. We didn't see it. We saw one uh, Belgian female suicide bomber during the Iraq war. Uh, so this is very different. Um, now, why is it happening? You know, people want to be heroes in their own story. There's a kind of adventure kind of component. There's the claim that this is an Islamist utopia, which a lot of people believe. And by the way, it's not that they're ignoring the beheadings. They see the Islamist utopia as being the beheadings are part of that. So, for instance, I was, took the opportunity today of, of reading the tweets of uh, these Colorado teenagers, who, who have hundreds of pages of tweets, and they, you know, they say gays need to be need, need to die. Right? These are Colorado teenagers, and so that fact that ISIS is throwing gays off buildings, 
and, you know, and killing them that way is actually part of the project that they are admiring. It's not, so it's not that they're sort of dismissing it, they're actually embracing it. Hmm. Yeah. Is there a, um, I mean, just to probe a little bit on that, I mean, why do you think that the fight, that, the, that, that ISIS is drawing in women um, at a, in a way that these previous battles in Afghanistan um, did not, in Bosnia you didn't really see that. Um, is there something particular about this moment in society? Um, it's primarily women from Europe, from what I understand. Um, what's the appeal? Well, for some, their claim to be an Islamic state is partly true. I mean, they control uh, more territory. They control about the population of Switzerland, so it's 8 million people. Um, you know, they, uh, I don't think their pretensions to be a state are going to go on forever. Uh, but the fact is that, and, and you know, Bag Bin Laden never said, I'm the caliph. You know, Baghdadi is making a claim. His claim to be the caliph means that he's not only in charge of ISIS, he's in charge of all Muslims anywhere and throughout history. I mean, it's an extraordinary claim. Uh, most people, don't, I think that's a serious delusion, but a lot of people don't, uh, unfortunately. Um, and uh, they are signing up for a, you know, an Isla Islamist utopia. And maybe in the 70s, they might have joined some other kind of I don't know, group that kind of allowed them to, you know, maybe in, if they were Americans, they might have joined the Weather Underground or the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, this is sort of a way of joining something that's exciting and, and, and utopian in, in, in its claims. And we've seen this throughout you know, European history, that people are attracted to these groups that claim that they have, you know, that a perfect society is being created. And they understand that the history has a direction, and they've created this perfect society. And whether that's Marxist or Islamist, it's sort of the same impulse that we've created heaven here on earth. Most people don't buy that, but some people will. Yeah, I mean, Mona, you mentioned earlier this, this, this notion that the women who go to join ISIS are more like the women who went to be with Charles Manson. Um, <coughs> that, and I mean, sort of building out from that, the, the question then is, you know, is ISIS a, you know, as some people have called it, a death cult um, rather than a, um, you know, an extreme um, version of the kind of violent, the sort of the natural um, successor to Al Qaeda, or is it something completely different? Um, I think it's both. I think it's very disingenuous for my fellow Muslims to claim that, that Daesh has nothing to do with Islam because they clearly base a lot of the stuff they do on various parts of scripture and, and sayings of the prophet and obviously then take it to a, a most horrific radicalized version of that and something that I find absolutely unconscionable and abhorrent but but at the same time uh, it's it, they are they, they belong to something that has just gone horribly wrong in this moment in time with with the way that certain people think Islam should be but you know one of the things that they've done with with women that I think is is quite fascinating and, and horrific at the same time because you know th these women, as we, we, we talked earlier when we had our, our call, um, the women who were drawn to ISIS or, or Daesh, and then you know, you, you perhaps in an imaginary conversation, I would say to them, "How could you go and join a group that has enslaved women?" As we know, they've done with, with Yazidi women, and you know, they they will dismiss them as infidel women. But then, you know, I want to know as a feminist, because you often hear this word agency. I mean, we use this word agency quite lightly, and I think it it's a very serious matter. I, a lot of my fellow Muslims, again, because of we find the stereotyping of Muslim women as oppressed and, 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 and you know we want you to see us as women with agency. We'll talk about the women and the, the girls who join Daesh as having agency, but agency to do what? Because I think when, when we put this feminist label on it, it's like using feminism to cut feminism at its knees. So I'm, I, I cannot support these young women going to join a group basically that says girls as young as nine um, should be married and you shouldn't work and you know you just come over here basically and produce babies because they're not going to fight with these men. But you know, some of the teenage girls in the UK, and you might have, crossed, you might have come across this, um, Peter, but one of the latest reports about them was saying that they love the, the ISIS eye candy. So Daesh seems to be trying to market itself as the good-looking jihadis to, join, to, to draw these European girls. So they're like the pop stars of the, the armed extremists, the, the lunatic fringe basically, of the armed extremists. And you know, when you ask me about your average kind of jihadi, I think he's this really ugly bloke with a, a, an ugly, scraggly beard. Anyone who knows anything about me knows I love bearded men, but not the scraggly bearded type. <laughs> and, and so the, the, uh, the Daesh guys are the neatly trimmed beards. And they have all these videos they've uploaded on YouTube to target these girls. And there are quotes from these young women in the UK 
because this is a very bushy saying, oh, these, the, you know, they're eye candy. And they think that they're these kind of pop idols and, they, and, and they're Muslim on top of it. So, but then uh, my question then is, so you recognize the sexual agency of these girls to then be sexually attracted to these men? It's really quite warped, you know? Eat your heart out, uh, Justin Bieber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, when it comes to who goes, uh, there is the pull factor that we talked about, like something pulls them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the push factor too, which we should also not forget. Uh, I've studied many of the cases of the Norwegian girls who go to fight with the Daesh or with the ISIS, or to go not to fight because none of them are allowed to fight there, even though it seems that the men and the women who go, they go for the same reasons, but they go to play different roles. But the, the girls that I've studied, the push factor is that they don't feel at home in Norway. Is there something about us? Should we also talk about our societies? Is there, is there something about Europe that don't make them feel at home? So they've all gone through some radicalizations. They are mostly from, well, quite secular, not very religious homes, Muslim homes, uh, those that I've studied. And uh, they go through the radicalization in the mosque or in some uh, Islam net in some of the organizations. And they want to wear the, first the hijab, then the niqab, and they're not allowed. Mm. And one girl, for instance, she was not well, of not course, allowed by their families or by the by state. The school, by, by the, the school. school. Yeah, at school. Uh, and one of them, who was an A student, but she could not have sport classes because uh, she could not bump into a man. That mm. was her impression. So she didn't get her, uh, how do you say, her bachelor mm. um, high school exam. And is and that's what radicalized her, made her, okay, this society is not for me. I can't live my life here. I can't finish high school. Because even she had the best degree in all matters, but because she didn't do the sports, mm. she could not get her exam and go into university. Mm. So it's like, uh, we also have to look at, is there something that pushes this girl out? Are there something, can we be more flexible? Can we be, uh, do some compromises? Uh, and I think one last thing about that is it's very important to support the civic society, to mm. support the civic organizations who talk on the ground with these kids mm. uh, because they have a great distrust in the government uh, and great distrust in, in you know, the elites, in the, mm. in the um, policy makers. Yeah. Now, these, these extremist um, groups always seem to arise in response to what's seen as a straying away from orthodoxy. Um, you know, the, the, the received, um, you know, power of the day is not, um, you know, following the right path. Um, and, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to bring Nigeria into this discussion because, um, you know, Northern Nigeria is a very deeply conservative society. Uh, Islam has been there for hundreds of years. Um, and yet suddenly you've seen exploding on the scene a group that has a very different interpretation of its duty towards Islam and its, and its practice of Islam um, that has taken a terrible toll um, on women and girls, certainly, but on the country as a whole. Um, so could you talk, Alexa, could you talk a little bit about sort of the roots of Boko Haram and, and where it came from and, and the impacts that it's had? Yeah, I mean, Boko Haram arose in a setting where I mean, Nigeria for a long time, um, since independence, unfortunately, has been plagued by deep corruption, by leadership that hasn't been accountable. So in northern Nigeria, even before Boko Haram, there have always been efforts by residents to push their leaders to be more accountable. And leaders have recognized this. And that solution has always been in the form of Sharia law. Um, but it's always been what residents have wanted has always been sort of a more moderate form of Sharia. They've, to them, Sharia represents their leaders being accountable. Um, it represents them providing for the poor, um, using money you know, non-corruptly, um, punishing criminals. Um, and so politicians will go, and when it's time for them to turn for their elections, they'll say, yeah, we're, we're going to push for a more extreme version of Sharia law. And what happens is they get elected, and what they um, impose is just something sort of like a morality police, where they'll say, oh, you, you, know, you can't watch dancing and music in movies, or you. Um, or women can't ride motorbikes. And residents push it back against that, because that's not what they're used to. They're used to um, a Sharia law existing along with a more secular federal law. They're used to um, women in society are, have always been, no matter if you're talking about Muslim or Christian context, always been leaders in their communities. They've always worked. They've always um, driven. They've always done things that men can do, despite 
being in more conservative societies. And so, um, but the problem with the fact that politicians would sort of use Sharia as this political tool and not follow up on it, not follow up on being accountable, um, it created, it, it narrowed the space for um, people who are dissatisfied with the corruption, who wanted to change and the change wasn't coming about through these politicians. And so because there was, well, there wasn't enough space for these people to, to come through, you know, they, they became disillusioned, as happened in other places, and, and more radicalized. And that led to the formation of Boko Haram. It led to um, young imams preaching about the ills of society, like corruption, and, and a lot of people really being in support of it. You know, they were like, this, they're saying, this is right, this is what we've wanted. Um, what happened was, though, is that Boko Haram evolved. Um, from that sort of more pure beginnings into you know, copying Al-Qaeda, now copying ISIS. And what's interesting about Boko Haram is that kind of like the Christian fundamentalist group, the LRA in, um, in Uganda, um, it's never been interested um, in being a fight that maybe like ISIS, women and men can join. It's always been a fight for men. Um, you know, they've always had particular use for girls and women, that's as sex slaves. Um, you know, without a doubt. So young women have never been interested in joining because, mm -hmm. I mean, within their local settings, the, the government may be corrupt and unaccountable, but at least women have a, a, a great degree of freedom, you know, with education, um, with working. And so, it, you know, it's interesting now that Boko Haram has pledged allegiance to ISIS, you know, are they actually, besides copying their public executions and beheadings and things like that, are they going to imitate anything more substantial, I wonder, in terms of are they trying to recruit young people? Are they trying mm -hmm. to make it more appealing to women? Because as of right now, um, when, when Boko Haram occupies certain territories, you know, women are afraid. You know, they don't want to go near them. And maybe they eventually, as their last resort, you know, they will um, partner up with some of the members, but only as a last resort. It's never mm -hmm. seen as an appealing thing for women in, in Africa, in West Africa, or even in Uganda. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, but do you see a, um, you know, you see this sort of the similarity between these these practices between the LRA, which was a, you know, which which is a kind of um, cult-like um, group that claims these kind of Christian roots um, and this this prophetic vision, um, very kind of post-apocalyptic. Um, I mean, there, there's a real linkage there between the, you know, the, the ideology and, and the sort of death cult nature of Boko Haram, but also the death cult that you see with ISIS. Um, is, is religion legitimately a part of, of, of what these groups are about? Um, and and, and how, does that, how does that affect um, the way in which these groups um, deal with women? I think the short answer is yes. Mm. It's not a comfortable answer. but. Um, to, I mean, the two points. One is 80% of the terrorist attacks in the world today take place in five countries, all of which are Muslim majority countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Nigeria. And they're all conducted basically by Islamist terrorist groups. Well, it's impossible to understand them without reference to their Islamic beliefs. Um, and just as Christian fundamentalists, you know, played an instrumental role in the Crusades, uh, it's hard, or, or you know, you can't understand the settler movement in, in the Palestinian territories without reference to you know, fundamentalist Jewish beliefs about the sacred nature of those territories. You can't understand this without reference to Islam. If Bin Laden was here, or Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, of course he wouldn't enjoy this very much. Uh, but, <laughs> but he would say it's about the defense of Islam, and and he he would have a very articulated way to explain that. And I just think, you know, we live in a society that's uncomfortable with saying these things because either for PC reasons or we live in an increasingly secularized world that isn't comfortable with references, the discussions of, or taking seriously people's religious beliefs, even, even deluded as they are. Uh, but I do think there is something to do with this, and I, I don't think you could take it away. Yeah. And can I add something about the Please, religious aspect? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important as well to remember that, I mean, I mentioned earlier women of Islamist movements, and, and 
for me, some of the hope that I got was I, I went to Tunisia last year. And Tunisia, if anything, of all the, the countries that have had uprisings and revolutions since 2010, when Tunisia opened the way, basically, um, Tunisia has another movement, which people often compare to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. But they're nothing like it. I mean, as an Egyptian who's been to Tunisia several times and who's very familiar with the Muslim Brotherhood and then the Salafis, who are like the ultra right wing radical versions of Islamists, um, the, Tunisia's Anahda movement is much more like the average kind of conservative Egyptian. And a moment of hope that came for me there, which, which helped me see that not all, not all Islamist women are, should be or are always the foot soldiers of patriarchy, is the moment when Tunisia, the Tunisian Constituent Assembly had to write their constitution. And the women, it was because of the women fighting from the secular side as well as the Islamist side, not all the women from Nahda, but enough women from their so-called Islamist movement in Nahda, which had a kind of a majority among all the different um, coalitions that, that, that came together to make the Constituent Assembly, enough women from the Islamist movement pushed for a clause in the Tunisian constitution, which is the first of its kind in the Arab world that guarantees equality between men and women. And when I interviewed one of these women from Al-Nahda, now this woman, when she, when she went to university, she, she's a lawyer. She went to law school under Ben Ali's regime. She couldn't wear a headscarf because headscarves were banned. She had to wear a beret because she wanted to go to school but also continue to cover her hair according to her, her own you know, interpretation of, of Islam and the interpretation that says women must cover their hair. And when I asked her why she pushed for this, um, uh, article in the Tunisian constitution. She said, because I believe that men and women are equal, and because I believe that when women fight, only men benefit. And I think this, the, that, that is basically you know, the, the heart of it, when women fight, only men benefit. But then you know, I see it in my Egyptian context, and, I, and the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood is nowhere near that. We had women in Egypt who allowed religion to be used against them to justify things like removing the, age, the minimum age of marriage, to call female genital mutilation, which is a form of torture and terrorism practiced on the bodies of girls and women, to basically silence us and make us into the brides, you know, the nine-year-old brides of Baghdadi and his fellow lunatics. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and this is the moment that I think we're in, in the revolution, which is why I say that we need a social and a sexual revolution in which we make these points, in which we say, I will not allow you to, look, to use the, these scriptures that for the longest time allowed you to silence me as a Muslim woman. Can I make an observation? The, it, it, the big problem is, is that some of these scriptures are in the Quran. And the Quran is not a book, it's the word of God, right? And, oh. I mean, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, this, this is, I think, this is the problem about fighting back against uh, some of the, this is very, I think it's why it's very hard for Muslims to say, hey, these guys are completely wrong. Right, you, but I know scholars who are using the Quran yeah. to fight those guys. I belong to a movement called Musawa, which is a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. It was launched in Malaysia in 2009, and it has scholars like Amina Wadud, who led us in a mixed gender Friday prayer. She led men and women in prayer, which many people will say the Quran doesn't allow, but she says the Quran doesn't prohibit. So you have scholars who are fighting a frontline fight. I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm from I'm from this, but we we are at a moment because I know these scholars and I. Believe to this movement, where more importantly, female scholars of Islam are saying, we have the right to challenge this and to say, you can't use this against me. And yeah, it's necessary. But I, but I do wonder, is, is a prerequisite of, of the advancement of feminism a, a, a broader kind of secular, secularism, right? I mean, can, can, a, can you be a, an observant, um, conservative Muslim woman um, and in a feminist context um, if you're not part of a religious minority in the sense that you're, the broader context you're in is one in which, in which the, the, the governing rules are, are secular, right? So, I mean, I, 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 I think basically my question is, 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 is religion compatible with, 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 is religion in this way compatible with feminism? Well, this is why I call myself a secular feminist. Right. But if we had someone like Amina Wadud here, who is a scholar of the religion and who has studied in Al Azhar, you know, the Sunni Muslim, the Sunni Muslim world's university, basically, that produces clerics for the whole world, she will tell you that she is a practicing Muslim who believes that you can be, but she, she's not conservative. You know, the problem for me is the conservatism of it. If, if any religion, I find the conservative orthodox elements of it not conducive to feminism, which is why I'm much more secular and much more progressive in the interpretation. Because I, for me, I, I, I don't want to get into the fights of my verse versus your verse. Mm. But I think this is a problem for Christians. I had, I had students at the University of Oklahoma who were Christians 
who, you know, who would admit to having signed a purity pledge. Mm. Now, for your average American feminist, this is in the United States. For your average American feminist, the idea of a purity pledge, where you promise your father virginity till you get married, I mean, this is totally antithetical to feminism. But, but these girls identify as Christians, you know. More progressive, liberal interpretation of Christianity perhaps would reject a purity pledge. I mean, my point here is this, this is, again, not specific to Islam. This is a fight that I think all people of religion have right. to fight. And those of us who identify as secular have to put the flag down and stop kowtowing and giving in to the conservatives. Well, that's why I think the solution, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, when you're talking about Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab, um, that the solution is more political rather than religious. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, Boko Haram is not a group that I mean, yes, I mean, its original mission did have to do with Islam, but it grew directly out of a political situation, um, Al-Shabaab as well. And so at the end of the day, I mean, I think that the solution has to be political. It has to come from, you know, governments um, or on the ground as well from who are willing to engage with the root causes of, of these insurgencies. I mean, I always say Boko Haram could have been defeated a long time ago if there were any actual legitimate will on the part of the Nigerian government. But it hasn't. It was ignored. Um, and so, because this sort of battling of, of verses from the Quran and the Bible, it's not going to work um, in a lot of cases. And I think at least in these two cases with the Boko Haram and LRA, it's it has to come yeah. from Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I've, I've, I mean, I've been following, um, you know, this, this question and, and the American obsession with radicalization in the Sahel for years. And I think um, m many of, my, many of my, my colleagues who worked in West Africa sort of scratched their heads and said, you know, um, is, how likely is it that, you know, a homegrown insurgency would arise out of, and this might sound impolitic, but the black African Muslim experience, um, which is a very distinct thing from the 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 um, Arab African Muslim experience um, and and which is itself distinct from the Gulf Arab uh, and you know there, there there are many different gradations so I mean uh, you know uh, there are certain, the house of culture in northern Nigeria is quite conservative and was conservative in the pre-Islamic era um, and, and ported that ex conservatism with it um, into, into Islam. But there are other parts of the Sahel where, you know, um, you know the, 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 the traditions are very different. You go to Burkina Faso where people look quite similar to the people right next door and you'll see women riding motorbikes, um, you know, which would be never seen in... Um, in in um, in a place like Kano in in northern Nigeria, so I think I think there's enormous variation and gradation, um, which again like leads me to the question of. Um, you know, how, how does, uh, you know, something that's such as an extreme ideology that um, has such rigid um, um, gender roles kind of come out of in a place where you had so much fluidity, um, so. Well, you know, um, Alexis, and, Alexis and I were talking earlier about the black, Ameri uh, the black Muslim experience in Africa in that, you know, a lot of the excuses that are usually made for the armed radicals of from a specifically Arab context of you know colonization, poverty, uh, despotism, all of that exists in many other sub-Saharan, uh, mm -hmm. many other countries in Africa, especially those sub-Saharan. You don't get African jihadis, and I think the element of racism is an important one to look at when you look at Daesh now, ISIS, uh, because it was a story a few months ago of an Indian man who went to join them, and he ended up being given toilet duties, mm -hmm. and he said, "I didn't come here to, jo to, to clean toilets. I came here for jihad." But you know, in in that very kind of um, hierarchical, and this is a specifically Gulf thing, but, but, but in many parts of the Arab world, we're unfortunately very racist, and, and, it, and it's, well, we're in deep denial about this racism, despite all this song and dance we make about Islam being very, very uh, you know, equal rights, and Bilal, and the prophet's uh, you know, call to prayer man you, uh, was, a, was a, a black African. So this man obviously went there and joined um, Daesh and found out that you know, they were racist bastards, and mm. left and, and went back to India. Mm. So I think that this is an important lesson for us, <laughs> because you know, for me, as, again, you know, speaking as an Egyptian Muslim, I'm really distressed by the way that Daesh ends up creating, and I call them, I, I, I insist on calling them the lunatic fringe minority of the Islamic spectrum. But you know, they, they keep being, we allow them to set an agenda 
obviously they're very violent and, and it's not a good thing. But we focus on them in such a way that they create this agenda that the rest of us have to react to. And I'm setting an agenda, a feminist agenda. And there are other people in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East and North Africa setting an agenda that is much more important than the Daesh agenda. But you all and the media keep making us circulate around them and you know, turn ourselves inside out and apologizing, which I refuse to do, because I don't apologize for them because they do not represent me and I'm not responsible for them. But what I wish we would do is, when we find examples like this Indian man who had to leave because of the racism, you know, point out what they're doing wrong, but also point out all the other things that are going right so that we're not constantly revolving around the Daesh agenda. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because we're taking a group that is, yes, granted, very violent, but also tiny in terms of numbers of the greater Islamic world, and we're constantly told, you know, apologize for them, justify them, and explain why, why, why they do this. Yeah, I mean, it's true, Boko Haram is a couple thousand people out of a country of 170 million. And I, I, I even, like, don't really like calling them an extremist Islamist group, because, I mean, as we said, it's a death cult. I mean, that's it, what it is. It, it copied its, its roots are with LRA, it's all these original militias that, at the end of the day, we don't know what they want. They're just nihilistic. They just want to create havoc, and I think that's the best way to describe them. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's even worth calling them extremists. Unfortunately, it's those sorts of people that create history, right? I mean, history is not generally made. History often is bad news, so done by bad people. Um, and the news business covers, tends to cover bad news, not news that's sort of indifferent. And there's a natural tendency to cover this because uh, that, I think, is just human nature. I mean, the New York Times covered this in great detail, CNN, where I work, does. And these guys have seized the news stories. Uh, I mean, uh, Brookings says there's 46,000 active ISIS Twitter accounts. That's the most conservative number, up to 90,000. So, I mean, I think it's unavoidable that we focus on them, even if maybe you know it would be desirable not to. But I mean, we're living in a world where they're making history and news. I mean, they've you know they've done something unprecedented, which is create this jihadist. This, not since uh, you know the Ikhwan took Saudi Arabia in the 1910s, 1920s, uh, has a jihadi group done what they have done? Um, and we can't take that away from them right now. Hopefully, we will be able to. But it, we can't ignore it. Oh, I'm not saying ignore it. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the context that we give them. Uh, not even the context, the size of, of the, the amount of attention we give them. Of course, we can't ignore them. I mean, I, yeah. I come from a journalistic background. But just. I want to put them in context, in, in the sense that you're saying, Boko Haram, you know, what is the population of Nigeria? What, what is, what, what, how does the rest of the Islamic world feel about Daesh and, and what they represent? And, and who are the people resisting against them and what are they doing? What about the women vigilantes mm -hmm. in northern Nigeria who are like, taking up homemade arms recently and like, who are Muslim also? Right. And the female Kurdish fighters, you know, the, the right. anarchists and the, the anarchists and the feminists of the Kurdish fighters in Iraq who, and, and in parts of Syria as well. I mean, these, these are heroes. Because, you know, when we talked earlier as well, I mean, the idea of women joining radical groups and armed radical groups, I mean, this is very old. This is not new. But at least they were fighting. I mean, women of the Bader Meinhof gang in West Germany. There's, there's a very famous book on women and violent extremism or terrorism, whatever you want to call it, that was actually titled Shoot the Women First. Because women of Bader Meinhof were extremely fierce, hmm. especially when police raided their hideouts. And so there, were, there was a famous quote from a, a West German police official who would advise his police officers to shoot the women first because they fought the police most fiercely. Hmm. So you have, you know, this is not new, women wanting to join violent groups. And, and the, sense, the fact that women are violent, was, I mean, this is where agency does come in. Women can be as violent as men. I'm not of the feminist belief that if women took over, this world will be all touchy-feely love sex. No, I mean... You aren't? <laughs> Clearly not. I have, I have the Egyptian goddess of retribution. So I'm not. But, but no, you know, we're human beings. It's not about women and men. We're human beings. And clearly men and women are drawn to violent armed radical groups. But a woman in, in the Bader Meinhof gang and a woman in Daesh are two very different creatures. Right. Well, Alexis, tell us a little bit about these, these um, you know, women who are joining these, you know, Muslim women who are joining vigilante groups in northern Nigeria. To fight yeah, I mean, what I found so interesting was that, um, that because, I mean, so northern Nigeria, I mean, it is, described as mainly Muslim, but there are a lot of Christians living there. It's always been a religiously diverse place. 
And so, you know, maybe one would think that maybe it'd be Christians who are staying up to Boko Haram. But I mean, it's Muslims, like devout believers who don't believe Boko Haram represents anything that has to do with their religion. And so, you know, in the beginning, it was thousands of men and boys who were just taking up homemade guns and other types of arms and fighting against Boko Haram. And now um, women are joining. Because, I mean, it, it's sort of, you know, in tune with the local context. Met, women have usually, even a conservative, more conservative areas in Nigeria have been able to do most of what men have been able to do. And so now they're joining um, vigilante groups to protect their towns, their villages. Um, and, and, and you know, it's just an interesting counter narrative. You know, we hear so much about Boko Haram attack these people and female suicide bombers, but not much about the people who are resisting on the other side. Um, and it's there. I mean, actually, it's several key att attempted attacks that Boko Haram launched recently to take over a major northeastern city was only repelled because of the vigilantes, as opposed to Nigerian military. Um, so they're very crucial right now in, in the war in, in Nigeria. And I mean, I I think women have played a really crucial role as peacemakers, in my experience, in in um, in, in in conflicts in Africa. Um, what, what role do you see for women in countering extremism? I mean, like in Europe, for example, where where, where is there a, a place for you know for for the mother of that girl who's going to ISIS to to play that role um, um, to to detect and understand when someone's at risk? Um, yeah, uh, that mother has gone to Somalia. Uh, she says that uh, if I live in, uh, uh, in Norway, my children will either be uh, fundamentalist or atheist. So she brought the rest of the children, because the, the, the girl I mentioned is Somali. Oh, right, so yes, so yeah. she brought the whole family back to Somalia. But uh, when you study the girls who have gone uh, to Syria, for instance, you see they are just as bloodthirsty. When you read their Twitter accounts or their Facebook messages, like, I love that beheading, or uh, uh, I really, uh, one of the most, uh, one of the blogs I read, this was a woman who was so happy to be living in a villa. Uh, of course, taken from the Syrian people who right. used to live there. And she said that uh, the most happy I am when I get uh, um, uh, goods, uh, spoils of wars from the kufars, from the infidels, which mm -hmm. are, you know, hoovers and uh, washing machines. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so, so, so the, and still the same wom woman is on a martyrdom mission. But she's so happy for the new kitchen utilities she could get from the infidels. So it's, it's the this uh, Housewives of Raqqa? <laughs> yes, the Housewives of Raqqa. That is really nice. <laughs> But this is just one little point before I, I, uh, I get to the, what women can do. It's also how uh, religion, uh, how it's being abused, whether it's right. here uh, uh, in, with the Dash and ISIS, or like in, in Breivik's case that I've written about, he says he's fighting for Christian culture. That's why he did it, for Christian uh, European culture. And then when he was asked in court um, about his Christianity, he's like, well, I'm a cultural Christian. So the judge had to ask him, but OK, but what do you believe in? Do you believe in resurrection? Oh, I'm not that Christian, he had to answer. <laughs> and the judge asked, but have you read the Bible? Oh yes, I read it in primary school until the Labour Party took it off the off the uh, school uh, <laughs> cur cur curriculum. So of course that means he hasn't read the Bible. So it's right. it's just that religion. It's so easy to adhere to. Mm. It's been all those thoughts that have been thought uh, and approved before you. Even you're just like an angry, whether it's a angry white supremacist, uh, supremacist like Breivik or. Um, uh, Angry, the angry two French uh, Quachi brothers in Paris mm -hmm. is like you can always say it's it's about um, uh, religion. religion. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm sorry, the question about what women can do. I think uh, we also have to think women can do the same as men. I think that's um, actually one of the what I learned from my mother, who's uh, written feminist literature for children always told me, you can do whatever a boy can do, and a boy can do whatever you can do. So it's like, in Norway, I think one thing that we came far with, with Norway is like, we don't really have so much a gender gap. Like, what can women do? What can men do? But what can we all do? Mm. And after all, this is a 
anti, whether it's Breivik or ISIS, it's an anti-human movement, mm -hmm. uh, anti-feminist, but most and for, 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 uh, foremost anti-human. So I think the uh, most important thing is that we just expand the civic organization that work with the kids, work with those who are at risk, because it's not randomly who goes or who becomes radicalized. Like, there's patterns, there are clear patterns of them, uh, whether they're men or women in the radicalization process. And of course, a guy like Breivik, very difficult to find because he is, uh, uh, you know, he's white. He could buy all the weapons he liked. He could buy all the fertilizers. And it, nobody asked a question mm -hmm. because he was not, there was no red flags. If his name was uh, Abu Abdullah or something, he couldn't have rented that farm and bought the wrong fertilizers for the carrots that he did. Uh, and and the, the neighbors would have known. So, of course, those... Uh, terrorists to live among us uh, are, are much more difficult to to, to uh, counter. To, to, yeah. Yeah, than well, I mean, you know, terrorists like, um, 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 you know, the, 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 the young man in Isla Vista, the, the fellow in Pittsburgh who gunned down a bunch of women. Um, you know, you, you see these incidents where they, they, um, they um, you know, it's leave these uh, misogynistic um, uh, tracts behind. Um, do, do these do these men have something in common with with ISIS or with Boko Haram? I mean, is, do they share DNA? Well, they're men. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and men are more violent, right? I mean, uh, and uh, particularly young men um, are more likely to be. I mean, we, uh, in New America, we have a data set of. 250 Americans since 9-11 who've involved in some jihadi terrorist crime. Uh, 13 of them are women. So, I mean, it's just, mm. you know, and well, which is, I mean, which makes sense because at the end of the day, this is a highly misogynistic view of the world. They don't want women to be involved in an active way, right? right? In, the, in, in They want them just to be passive, you know, kind of part of the, you know, come and be part of the jihadi family, but that's it. Um, so, I mean, there, I think there, there are commonalities. Right. Yeah. It's a supposed return as to like something that's more pure, right? When when men had more, you know, I think especially in in um, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa too, uh, in the Middle East, as women gain more agency, as women gain more rights, men, when men are threatened by it in a lot of situations, and so the, these situ these groups are seen as a way to return when they had power, not over just you know, their immediate situations, but also over the, the women in their lives and things like that. And I think you can still even see that in a very developed country like this, where, yeah, men are still threatened by, by the gains women are making. And, and Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in Hannah Rosen's book, The End of Men, I mean, she, um, you know, she, she wrote, you know, what if the modern post-industrial economy is simply more congenial to women than men? You know, we're living in a society where, you know, blue-collar jobs are, um, are, are on the wane. Uh, you know, we have industries um, like healthcare and, um, you know, various other things where, you know, so-called female virtues and skills are more valued. Um, you're seeing societies like like South Korea, where where the balance is tipped, and parents prefer that were once very much you know male dominated, and sons were vastly preferred. Now people prefer daughters, um, you know, because they worry about who's going to take care of us when we get older. Where girls have a, a more earning power. Um, so I think we are living in a world. I mean, are men wrong to feel threatened by 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 the um, the uh, the the environment in which in which they live? I mean, in in um, you know, in Europe, in Muslims, you know, in, in, in um, you know, Egypt or in, in, um, in Nigeria, um, you know, is this, is this space that men control shrinking? Yeah. Well, for yeah. weak men, at least, I think we're talking about a certain type of men right. who feel that there's, they, don't get, they don't have the position that their fathers had or the privileges that their grandfathers had. It's shrinking, and they, they, because we have to, they have to fight on equal terms with women. So it, it's definitely, if you are, uh, you know, uh, a guy who, like all these white killers, whether it's Breivik or the guys you mentioned, right. it, it is Ellie a feeling Roger. of, yes, it, it is a feeling, and he's written extensively about he, how he hates feminists and, yeah. and women, um, Roger. And, and uh, the, the, those who are... 
they felt they lost privileges and, and they felt they should they deserve better. Uh, and uh, that is uh, like Breivik, his main uh, goal on 22nd of July on the island. Uh, well, he, he ended up killing uh, the kids, but his main uh, target was the former Norwegian Prime Minister, Gru Harlem Brundtland, uh, who was the Prime Minister all through his childhood, childhood. from he was two yeah. till 17, with uh, some governments in between. Mm -hmm. So she was the one, uh, the person who defined his miserable childhood, his miserable, uh, miserable teenage uh, period, and, and is a symbol of, uh, you know, uh, self-assured women who just take their plans, place and take for granted that they, uh, uh, so they feel threatened, yeah, definitely. Yes. I think that's a common trait. Yes. I mean, I, my question is, is it men who feel threatened or is it the notion of masculinity that is under threat? Mm -hmm. Because I think it, it's how we approach masculinity, what it means to be masculine. Because whether I look at Egypt, which is where I'm from, or the US where I lived, for almost 13 years before I moved back to Egypt. I think it's this notion of masculinity. Because I think of, you know, Egyptian, where we are in Egypt now, if you think of like the, the Mad Men era where the US was kind of about to tip over, where Don Draper's losing everything to Peggy and, you know, all the other women all <laughs> being threatened by them, you know. Th this, this is kind of like where we're kind of trying to push it up in Egypt. But, but here in the US, I mean, I, mean, I saw it. I, oh, and I continue to see it. And, and for me, I, the, the struggle for me, is that, especially as an Egyptian feminist, and I find a lot of inspiration from black feminists, because I look at, at women like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and others, who have taken all those notions, all those strands of fighting racism and sexism and looking at things like, say, black notions of masculinity in an environment where you feel beleaguered because you know that you have racism. And so the community kind of, you know, hunkers down and says, OK, this isn't the time to talk about uh, notions of masculinity and, and sexism and stuff because we've got all these people hating us. But as a feminist who is fighting these different isms, you have to say I'm fighting racism and sexism. So my fight is against this constructed notion of masculinity that, that promotes the patriarch over that. And that patriarch tells me to shut up when I want to fight against misogyny within and without, and also against the Islamophobes. And that's how I connect Egypt and, and the US together, because masculinity is under threat here as well. About, you know, and everything from Susan Faludi's book, Backlash, mm. which looked at kind of like white male masculinity, to what is going on now when I, when I look up black Twitter, and I see a lot of young black women on Twitter talking about black, black masculinity. And that's where I kind of get a global sense. Of, and you look at what's happening in India right now. Indian women fighting back against sexual violence, especially because we're hearing more about these horrific um, gang rapes. And, and I honestly think, as someone who, you know, I like to think of myself as a global feminist rather than just as an Egyptian feminist, I think we're at a moment in global feminism where we're kind of looking at, uh, across, you know, I look at African feminists. I look at feminists in India. I look at feminists in Latin America. And I feel genuinely it's a moment where we're recognizing this global movement. And we're asking men who are trying to move beyond these traditional notions of masculinity, again, to choose sides. So it's not men who are under threat. It's these traditional notions of masculinity that, that are under threat. But you know, you also have women who are reinforcing um, these, these, you know, sort of really terrible <laughs> practices against women. I mean, you know, you cited FGM earlier. This is a practice that, you know, it varies from place to place, but is often, you know, carried out and, and continued, you know, from mother to daughter to, you know, and, and, and enforced in that way. Um, you know, when I was a correspondent in India, I interviewed the, the, the mother of a man accused of, of, of raping um, a, a, a young woman. And, um, you know, she basically said to me, well, if he did it, um, you know, it's really the girl's fault because she shouldn't have been, um, you know, away from her parents' home. Um, and this was a woman who was sitting there surrounded by her daughters. Um, so I, I, I do think that there, there is a you know, there's a role, both positive and negative, that women play in these contexts. Um, so, I mean, how, how, you know, how important are women in, in sort of um, reinforcing these kinds of, of beliefs and values? Well, I, I think FGM and other examples, I think the way I usually try to explain it is these women understand what is expected of them by their society. And unless you try to change the society, oops, 
I'm now sounding like Star Trek. Um, unless you try to change these societies holistically, you can't, I, I think a lot of mothers in these scenarios are like the weakest link. Mothers that I've spoken to about FGM, they will tell you if I don't have this done to my daughter, she will not be able to find a husband. So these women, these, these mothers, this is gonna sound crazy, but these mothers cut their daughters out of love not out of hate, because they understand what they need to do to their daughters to present them to a society that they will then provide and protect. So unless we do this holistic change in which, and you know, many families in Egypt, for example, will stop cutting their daughters when their grandfather dies. Why? Because it's the patriarch that the mothers know they have to follow the rules of, even if it's the mothers who continue the tradition. So I think women understand, women know how to survive, and that survival says, what does this patriarchal, patriarchal society require of me and my daughters? We will do it for the crumbs that this patriarchal society throws us. That's how I explain it. Um, in, in Europe, there's a huge discussion underway about what to do about radicalization, what to do about foreign fighters, both male and female, um, going over. I mean, I think, um, and we were talking before the panel, um, it seems that the United States is likely, would, in, in confronting this problem, would take the kind of approach that it's taken elsewhere, you know, the kind of Guantanamo, like lock them up and throw away the key. Um, European countries seem to be experimenting with different ways to, um, to you know, rehabilitate, to track, um, you know, people who are, who are, who are, who are going to these places. What, what, what are you? What are you? What are some of the different things that you're seeing um, in in Europe to deal with this problem? Yeah, I think the European countries haven't really found out what to do. It's still early, so to make policy, it's um, the, it's, it's a great uh, discussion about it. Uh, but there are, of course, the hardline approach, and then there's the soft approach. Uh, and I think I think that. Uh, of course, if you have committed crimes abroad, you should be, uh, get, be sentenced for that. But I think the soft approach actually would work better. Because when you look at, um, there's an organization called EXIT, which is uh, for ex-neo-Nazis. Mm -hmm. And who were the best, um, especially in Sweden, this worked where, where this organization, uh, where the neo-Nazis were strong. Uh, who are the best person? to get someone who's about to go into neo-Nazism to get him out of it. It's someone who's been there himself. It's someone who can tell the youth, like, you know, I, I understand how you're feeling because I was there myself. And this is what's going to happen to you when you go into this organization. They're going to um, take you over. And the same happens with those who go to Syria. Who are the best people? to uh, f fight um, uh, against other young people going. It's those who can say, you know, I went. Do you know what happened to me in Raqqa? This happened to me. Uh, this is, you know, um, uh, place or whatever. They, they will know what, how to speak to these young people. And I think that is why it's, um, I know cases now of Norwegian citizens in Syria who don't, who want to come home but then they're so afraid of the, you know, what will happen to me? Will I be incarcerated for the rest of my life? Uh, there's a trial now going on. They, they sit in Syria and they follow online what is happening right. to that first trial. Yeah. So I think it's, it's very important to get them back, de-radicalize them, and, 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 and uh, have them around and, and, and speak to those who are about to go. Well, that's why it was so controversial, um, both in Uganda and then later in Nigeria, when they both floated the idea of having an amnesty program. You know, saying a lot of these people, these fighters, probably regret being there. They probably thought this was going to be one thing, it's turned into another. Um, and then Uganda was a little bit different because a lot of the fighters were abducted at first and then they became sort of more hardened and a lot of them wanted to escape anyway. Um, in Nigeria though, I mean, uh, there's still that, that sense that a lot of these fighters um, do want to get, but do want to get out, but they aren't able to because now, you know, if they do, they'll be killed, they'll be punished. Um, but I know that Nigeria is still thinking somewhat about having Amsterdam, which, in my opinion, I think would be good, because I'm sort of the belief that not all hope is lost for some of these fighters. Right. Have there been any women who've come back from Syria and been caught? I, 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 I'm not familiar with any cases. Um, A lot of this is, what, yeah. A lot of these are one-way tickets. Uh, of I mean, course, yeah. yeah. I don't know uh, partly, partly also, you know, it's very dangerous. Syria is one of the most dangerous conflicts of the modern era. It's five times more violent in Syria right now than during the Iraq War, which is also very violent. 
So uh, Nicole Mansfield from Flint, Michigan, 33-year-old African-American woman, went over there and was killed uh, uh, about uh, two years ago. So uh, I, people aren't coming back. But I, I will say on the United States front, I mean, there's a sort of zero tolerance of any form of risk. And so I'm reporting on a group of teenagers from Chicago uh, to uh, 1917 and 16, the Khan family. And they were stopped at O'Hare Airport. They were going to join ISIS. The older brother was going to be a fighter. Uh, the 17-year-old sister was going to be a, a sort of wife to one of the fighters. And they have a 68-year-old Irish Catholic lawyer called Thomas Durkin who said, look, at a fundraising dinner I attended, he said, look, if this was an Irish Catholic kid who had gone, you know, who was kind of doing something online, you know, the FBI would have gone to their parents and said, hey, you know, something's up with your kid. Instead, he's facing, you know, 15 years in prison for something that at the end of the day he didn't do. He didn't leave Chicago, didn't go anywhere. And he was excited by the sort of online media. And so right now we have this sort of very, you know, we, we, you know we're putting people in prison for inc very long periods. I don't think that will change. I was at DHS yesterday and we had a discussion about it, could we come up with some kind of off-ramp for these kids. And the point is, is that you're, you're going to take some risk if you do that because somebody was being, you know, you intervene with people who then go ahead and do what you didn't want them to do anyway. Uh, but I, so I don't see the, I don't foresee the government doing what the Danes are doing or uh, other Euro, you know, European countries are thinking about. We should have amnesty programs or rehabilitation programs. I don't th see it happening. Well, I mean, I think this gets to one of the sort of fundamental issues here, with, with which is that the the question of collective guilt versus lone wolf. You know, um, the um, the you know, someone like Brevik or like, um, you know, um, Elliot Roger is seen as a lone wolf, but someone who goes to join an Islam Islamic insurgency is seen as being, um, you know, but in the case of, um, you know, the young woman who, um, who joined, uh, who was part of the Charlie Hebdo um, um, plot, the girlfriend of Kulibali, you know, I mean, she sounded kind of like a lone wolf to me. Um, so it's a it's an interesting distinction um, between sort of how you how you treat people who get caught up in these things. Um, you know, even to use that passive language of get caught up as opposed to, you know, um, you know, go and join up, um, making it passive rather than active. Um, you know, I, I think also an important. An important element of this, can everybody hear me? Because I can't hear myself, okay. Um, I told the microphone guy I'm loud anyway, but I can't hear myself. <laughs> um, I think an, an important thing that we also need to discuss is the radicalization that happens when these men are put away forever mm. or for long periods of time. Like, you know, there, there have been people in Daesh who have said they spent time in Abu Ghraib. You know, so the United States unjustly, unfairly imprisons people, um, tortures people, and then what do you think is going to happen to those people? Because we go through this in Egypt too, you know. You put someone in jail for a really long time and you treat them terribly and you talk to them. What do you think is going to happen when they come out? Do you think they're just going to go back and live in, in the suburbs again? Do you think they're going to go back and, you know, just erase those years of their lives? It's important to remember that some of those men in Daesh, I don't know how many, maybe you know Peter, you know, were in Abu Ghraib and were perhaps tortured by the United States. And what did the United States do to Iraq? that created an environment. Now, I'm not saying that Daesh is, is, is an American invention, because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. But honestly, as US citizens, you have to ask yourself, what do things like Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and the United States' terrible history in foreign policy in the Middle East do in creating groups like Daesh that then we have to apologize and clean up for? It, 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 you have to face this. Well, I think the entire Daesh ISIS leadership was sitting together in Camp Bukka, which is yeah. another uh, prison camp in Iraq. So it's like definitely not a place to, a prison is not a place to de-radicalize people. Uh, yes, that, that seems... Can that I seems say clear. something? Yeah, about, no, please. Um, yeah. yeah, you mentioned the lone wolf and, and being part of a bigger group. The Norwegian social authorities wanted to take him away from his mother. And they said when he was five years old, they said that if he, this guy is not taken away from his mother, we are fearing for abnormal development in him. That did not happen. And when you look at the two French brothers, uh, they also grew up with a mother who was not able to take care of them, just like uh, Breivik's mother. Uh, she was the lone mother with uh, five kids. None of them had fathers around. The French authorities wanted to take away the kids, same as uh, with uh, Breivik. 
uh, she fought back, so they took three and left her with two. And that's those two. Mm. Uh, the others were placed in uh, foster care. And then uh, she takes to the street, she becomes a prostitute. Uh, when the younger brother, Sheriff, is 10, he finds his mother had committed suicide in the flat. Then he's pl placed in foster care, an orphanage. And um, then we say they were radicalized by the Iraq war, by the caricatures, uh, by uh, Abu Ghraib, the humiliation. And we don't ask, yeah, but what made these kids fertile ground for those ideas? Uh, and I think we also have to talk about childhood here. And we have to talk about our societies. And when you, in France, the Muslims, uh, as, as you mentioned, you know, it's an underclass. They're not accepted. So it's like we also have to talk about integration. This, of course, is a long-term de-radicalization. Uh, it's not a quick fix, but this is going to carry on. And we, uh, yeah, the minister here, we have to talk about childhood, mm -hmm. uh, adolescents, teenagers, and how we integrate and uh, yeah, live together. That reminds me, I wonder, we haven't talked about, I wonder if wives can play any role in this. I mean, I, I've thought about wives a lot, both when you have I, ISIS recruits going to join the war, they bring their wives, their kids. Um, with Boko Haram in Nigeria, a lot of the founders of that group, a lot of the key leaders, their wives were left behind in these northern towns and cities, and then they were detained by the military. And then when Boko Haram kidnapped the 300 girls last spring, um, one of their, when they were still willing to negotiate with the government, they said, well, you know, if, if you, one of their points was, well, if you release our wives and you leave them alone, um, you know, then, and do these other things, then maybe we'll release the girls. And I'm just wondering if, you know, maybe that can also be something that could be employed as a tool because A, you know, whether, if, if they're not being brought along with the fight and they're being left behind, but they're still considered to be family by these fighters, mm -hmm. do they play any role in, in, um, in the conflict and, and either yeah. way, pushing it yeah. back or forward? You know, I, I think that there are some interesting um, sort of, um, clues that we can glean um, from ISIS and its its views on women. Um, one of the cases that's really fascinated me is um, Kayla Mueller, who was the only um, um, surviving female, uh, surviving American in ISIS custody. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of us who n knew about her plight long before it was publicized had speculated, you know, would, would ISIS be willing to, to behead a woman on camera? Would they bring a female jihadi to do the beheading? Um, is there anything about sort of how those events, and of course, eventually, uh, you know, ISIS claimed that she was killed in the, um, you know, strikes after the, um, the, the Jordanian uh, pilot was, was, was um, was killed, um, but is, is there any? Is there anything? Uh, I mean, what, sort of, what does that bring to mind for 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 you all in terms of how ISIS views? Um, but is it true that she? I read that she was given as a wife before she was killed. It's she was given to be it's a not wife. Clear, it's not clear. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I just think it was a bridge too far for ISIS to do that, um, and that's what happened. I think it was. I was. I. Th I was. I thought that they wouldn't execute her. Um, and uh, I think they did, but they didn't behead her in, in, a, in a public fashion because they do have certain limits. But I wanted to address the foreign policy question because I think it's an important one. You know, American foreign policy certainly, you know, the invasion of Iraq set the conditions for what we see today. There's no doubt about it. But the Iraqi government begged us to come in to get rid of this scourge. So. And you know, when we intervene in Indonesia and save hundreds of thousands of people from the tsunami, or when we intervene very belatedly in, when Bosnians were killing the Serbs, when the Europeans were doing nothing, and stop that sort of genocide, essentially. So I, just, I, I would just sort of qualify what, with what you said, is that Amer you, know, you have to look at it sort of a little bit more holistically. American foreign policy sometimes has very bad outcomes, but also has some pretty good outcomes, particularly for Muslims. I mean, when the Indonesian tsunami happened, the, one of the most striking things to me was how little the Muslim community did for this, uh, for, the, for these victims. And it was really the United States that led the, the relief effort. So I just wanted to mention that as a, as a sort of caveat. Well, while I, mean, I, I was specifically talking about Daesh and, yeah. and the environment and radicalization and things like torture and, you know, an incredibly illegal setup called Guantanamo in which you've had men imprisoned for years with no charge and no trial. And, you know, 
you can rescue all the people you want in the tsunami, but in the United St in, in the, the, the Arab world, in the Middle East and North Africa, most people associate the United States with militarization, invasion, and the only Americans they see are soldiers. And so, and then at the same time, when we're fighting against torture and despotism, and we're fighting against dictators that the United States administration has continuously supported against their own interest, what happens in Indonesia is very far from what happens in the Middle East. So I'm talking about you know these young men who see what the United States does and see how the United States sides with the people we're trying to liberate ourselves from, and that's the foreign, that's the end of the foreign policy I'm talking about. I hear what you're saying, but I'm talking about another part of foreign yeah, policy. But the paradox is we overthrow Gaddafi, who was absolutely the worst person, and it was really a U.S.-led effort, obviously with the Arab League and others. Um, and now we've created a sort of a, a potentially an ISIS, another ISIS state in, in Libya. So. I know it's, it's very complicated because in this case we did exactly what you're suggesting, which is we got rid of this terrible despot, the US-led effort, uh, but it's now produced an absolutely worse outcome probably than Gaddafi himself. So I just say it's just not that, it's, it's very complicated is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I know. I mean, and I, I, one thing I wanted to make sure we had time to talk about was the, the, <laughs> the environment for women in the post-Arab Spring Middle East. Um, um, you know, uh, it was very inspiring to see women, um, you know, kind of at the barricades, and then horrifying to see women being attacked um, as they, you know, were out there um, either protesting or reporting on the protests. Um, and, and, you know, then you see the, you know, um, elect um, Islamic parties uh, who were then overthrown, and now wh where are we now? Um. Well, when it comes to Egypt, which I can speak out about the most because I'm, I'm from there, but I'll touch on other countries very quickly. I think what we're doing, what we're doing in Egypt, is we, we began a political revolution that has basically ended up replacing one man with another. And it's basically two forms of authoritarianism in the form of military rule and Islamism. And for me, they're two sides of the same coin. They're both very hierarchical. They're both very misogynist and clearly not conducive to feminism or, or gender equality. So the challenge on the political level is to create alternatives to these forms of authoritarianism. And, and where I see the alternatives coming in is the, the ground up change, what I call the social and sexual revolution. So to kind of put it a bit more poetically, if you want, we removed the Mubarak from the presidential palace, as I often write, but we need to remove Mubarak from the bedroom, we need to remove Mubarak from the street corner, we, remove, we need to remove Mubarak from our mind. Because it, it's those levels of revolutions that you're talking about. If you look at the other countries across the region that, that, that you're dealing with, obviously, everything as violent as Syria is to, to the mess that Libya is, but then Tunisia, where you, the Islamists, who were a form of that authoritarianism that I mentioned, um, have, re have learned the lesson of coalition building, and you've had many more women involved in the politics there because of the specific situation of a country like Tunisia. So I think that what we realize is happening is, and I think this is much more of an internal thing, because I get very frustrated when we hit anniversaries. On the outside over here, your quickest conclusion is the Arab Spring has failed, which really pisses me off, because we're fighting over there every day. It has not failed. What, what has happened is this is the consequence of 60 years of trying to unravel military rule as we are in Egypt, and we're four years into it. So this is the mess that is the natural outcome of just four years into trying to create alternatives to Islamism and military rule. What concerns me the most is, are we going to be given a space to create those alternatives? And that's why I constantly refer to those Western allies, for whom now someone like Sisi is someone who's going to keep the country stable so we can have an economic conference in Sharm el-Sheikh in Sinai so we can go back to business as usual. But we refuse business as usual because we've paid a really high price to get to where we are. So, and I, where it comes to women, I think that the social and the sexual revolution is at its heart a feminist revolution, where women realize that neither of these forms of rule is to their benefit. Um, so I think we can take a couple of questions. Hi, um, thank you all for your insight. My name is Hajar Naili. I'm a reporter for Women Z News. I wanted to add a little bit to what has been said. I, um, I met with three families and friends over the past summers whose daughter went to Syria. And one thing that came back during the interviews is uh, these girls were, could not identify anymore as belonging to the French society. So it's indeed something that uh, the recruiters of ISIS are playing with. 
However, I think it would be very insulting to the other Muslim women who live uh, through discrimination every day in France and who did not decide to uh, join the rank of ISIS in Syria to think it's the only reason be be behind that. Uh, another thing is um, the family said, we don't really know who is um, um, talking to us when our daughters uh, send us text messages or discuss with us through Facebook. At least at the beginning, when they join ICs, it seems that um, the people that are taking charge are uh, writing. Eventually, um, the last thing that I would like to say is I don't know if um, those people will necessarily need a de-radicalization. A lot of these women want to return to France, but of course they're not allowed to. They're, I talked to one brother who went to Syria. His sister is detained by uh, Al Nusra Front. He met her twice, but they did not allow him to return with his sister. So I think these women, a lot of them, want to return. They're not allowed to do so, and I think the, the, the experience itself with ICs has de-radicalized them. They have seen beheadings, and um, they just realized that, I remember one father telling me that, my daughter told me that what they're doing is far from what I've learned about Islam. Yeah, I mean, that's one, I mean, we talked about, um, about these Twitter accounts, and, you know, there was a BuzzFeed piece with, you know, what were claiming to be tweets from women who were, you know, pledging allegiance to ISIS. And the truth is, we don't know who's writing these tweets, right? I mean, they, they, they could all be, um, you know, an elaborate ruse that are all written by men. This is all feels very, very theoretical. Okay, folks, keep them brief. Hi, I'm Alessandra Massey at International Business Times. Um, we talked a lot about Daesh and Boko Haram, but I was wondering what the role of women is in Shia militia groups and Shia extremist groups. In, in Shia? Shia. Uh, in Shia radical groups? Yeah, okay. Does anybody know? Peter, you want to tackle that one? Um, Not to put you on the spot? Well, <laughs> some of the first female suicide bombers were with Hezbollah. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't really know the answer to that in any detail. But if you, if you talk about Iran, I mean, this isn't Shia radical groups, but if you talk about Iranian society and feminism in Iranian society, you have an active feminist movement in Iran in a way, say, that doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia. So it's not, you know, it, it's not something that can be dismissed because of, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini and, and the way that the, the, the Islamists or, or the Shia fundamentalists co-opted and hijacked the Iranian revolution um, is one thing. But what, the Iranian feminists I know, you know, they're, they're like eons ahead of, say, what Saudi feminists have been able to achieve. But that's not your question. Your question is about radical groups, and I, I don't know. Thank you so much. Thank you.